Well, thank you, Neil. And let me say it's a pleasure to be joining you all today. I think uh, education in contouring for prostate cancer can only bring better care down the road. To give you an idea of our background in prostate cancer at the Fox Chase Cancer Center, uh, as many of you may know, we have a long tradition in prostate care. We treat anywhere between five and 600 cases of prostate cancer a year, both at our main site in northeastern uh, Philadelphia, as well as in our now two satellite sites that are dedicated to genital urinary care alone. I am. Uh, I, I practice exclusively in genital urinary care. Uh, I sit on the RTOG steering committee for GU cancers, and uh, have been a radiation oncologist for 23 years. With that beside uh, behind us, let me say that the uh, planning and the preparation of what is being called the gold data set, or at least my best guess, um, starts the preparation of this starts well before the patient ever presents to the clinic. We have a, a very uh, stringent preparation that we ask the patients to go through prior to uh, the day of simulation. The night before, every patient drinks a 10-ounce bottle of magnesium citrate to help them evacuate their bowels, and two hours before simulation, all patients patients undergo an enema. Uh, we ask all of our patients for the planning uh, and for each day of care to drink between 25 and 30 ounces of fluid in the 30 to 60 minutes prior to their treatment to ensure good bladder filling. When a patient comes in for simulation, he is queried that, uh, to see if he has completed all of this and to ensure that he is feeling that his bladder is full. If not, we don't even put him on the SIM table. Once a patient does meet those criteria and the patient is uh, scanned, uh, the physician will review the scan while the patient is on the table to ensure good uh, bowel and bladder preparation. In the case of the bladder, good filling. Uh, it is seldom, uh, it is, I should say, it's unlikely that you will get a good data set with a bladder less than 120 to 150 cc's, and uh, we like to ensure that patients have at least that level, uh, often seeing patients with two and 300 uh, uh, cc bladders, uh, which makes the planning uh, and the delivery of care much better. The bowel preps are not repeated for daily treatment, but as I mentioned, the patient does fill their bladder to that level each and every day. Once the scan is completed, the uh, next step before any structures are identified that I take is setting it up on our treatment planning software in a way that gives me the best chance to identify the delineation between the various structures. To do this, and I should mention that we use Eclipse planning software for our patient care, First of all, uh, I like to maximize the image so that it fills most of the screen area in the contouring section. Uh, this allows, again, better definition. The other thing that I do is I adjust the window and level to uh, what I consider the optimal visualization of the tissues. There is not a set number for window and level here. What I use is something that I think anybody who's contouring can do. By selecting a scan that goes through the acetabulum, including the femoral head, I will adjust the window and level till there's clear demarcation between the wall of the acetabulum and the cortex of the femoral head. Very often, the window and level for your scans will be set at a bone setting, which is higher than you will uh, see me use for soft tissue delineation. By doing this, every patient is their own control, and there's not a set window and level that you need to go to each time. Once that's done, though, the contouring does begin. So I look at it as the pre-simulation, the post-simulation, and then the actual target delineation phases in the creation of a data set. I think you'll see in a few moments that when we look at the results section, and I don't mean to give away any of the results here, but probably the easiest thing to draw is the bladder. And I like to start with easy things. So I will go in and identify the top and bottom cuts of the bladder and start to draw. I will draw by hand the first anywhere from three to five cuts at the top and bottom of the bladder and then in the central part of the bladder, often draw every second using interpolation software to fill in in between. 
in this way at the areas where the contour is changing rapidly at the top and bottom. It's delineated by the physician and it's done in a more uh, expeditious manner. Um, the pubic symphysis is a good indicator of where you're reaching your lowest bladder cuts. You may sometimes have bladder tucked in under that area, but it's usually uh, a small amount of bladder, and very few patients have any significant amount of volume once you reach the completed pubic arch. The next thing I do in preparation is I go to draw the rectum, and I usually begin at the top of the rectal volume. Now, this is a question that may come up later in the presentation and in the discussion, but the, the limit I use for the upper border of the rectum is very similar to what's included in the RTOG studies. The RTOG states that the rectum will be um, contoured from its origin at the rectosigmoid flexure or the bottom of the SI joints, whichever is more inferior. Uh, as I told my dosimetrist once, I look at where the rectum goes from being squiggly to being round, and that's usually the rectosigmoid flexure. Uh, start contouring there and work down. The uh, area of delineation between the anterior rectal wall and the prostate is always a question. Uh, with good adjustment of the window and level, however, this often becomes less of an issue. Uh, the other thing that I should say is in evaluating the CT scan before it ever gets to the delineation of structures portion of, of the planning, uh, we look to see that the rectum is no more than about three centimeters in dimension. If there's a gas bubble in that area during simulation, we'll use a red rubber catheter to uh, release any bowel gas. Uh, if there is a lot of bowel gas or the bowel gas extends high into the, um, the colon, uh, this may not be possible to, to clear completely. Um, once the rectum is drawn, uh, I will go in and start to draw the markers within the prostate. Uh, for IGRT purposes, we use visicoil markers or calypsoactive beacons. Uh, I tend to use visicoil, which are one mis uh, millimeter by 11 millimeter of visicoil, and anywhere from two to three markers are placed within the prostate gland. Our rule of thumb is if the gland is 30 grams or less in size, uh, two markers will suffice in any gland greater than 30 grams. We like to use a third marker. These are placed by our urologist, and as they're placed on our urologists, I should say, and as they're placed under ultrasound guidance, anywhere there's a marker, there's prostate. So by drawing the markers, I will sometimes find a cut that I might have thought was the very top or just beyond the top of the prostate that includes the marker, and I trust our urologist that they place that in prostate tissue, again, helping delineate the superior and inferior extent of the prostate. In this area, you need to watch for uh, prostatic calcifications. Uh, however, these are usually clearly different from the markers. Once the bladder, the rectum, and the markers are drawn, pretty much you've identified everything that's not prostate. So the job then is to start going in and drawing the prostate. I don't use interpolation in drawing the prostate contours uh, whatsoever. Uh, I like to draw them individually, again, making sure that there's no overlap of prostate tissue with other structures that have been previously uh, delineated, like the bladder or the rectum. Uh, a tissue is prostate or it's not. It's either fish or fowl. It's not both. Uh, I've often seen in residents and other contouring um, non-physician non contours, uh, the tendency to overlap uh, one structure into another, and that's clearly not the case. The other thing that I think you need to remember when you're contouring the prostate is the fact that laterally, as you get lower into the pelvis, you'll start to encounter the levator ani muscles, which are the susp uh, suspensory muscles of the pelvis, also sometimes referred to in its inferior most extent as a urogenital diaphragm. I think this creates a point of confusion, and people tend to say, well, I'll include that in my structure uh, just in case. Uh, you need to recall that uh, when you're delineating a structure that you will be adding margin to it later in the creation of a PTV, and that may account for some of the uncertainty. So it's important to try to delineate the interface between the prostate and the, um, the adjacent uh, levator muscles in the low part of the uh, pelvis. 
What I do in this uh, point is once I've drawn the prostate and the inferior extent I'll address in just a moment, uh, what I do is then turn on a tool in Eclipse which displays the cut above and cut below the current slice. And I'll review through the prostate to ensure that in some area I didn't get overly enthusiastic either anteriorly or laterally. Um, this is uh, a very helpful, uh, but I don't use that until each structure, uh, excuse me, until the structure on each uh, scan slice has been drawn. I use this to then refine and uh, make decisions uh, whether uh, I need to alter uh, cuts in any area. Now, the inferior extent of the prostate is, is always a cause of, uh, I think, consternation and concern, and there's a number of ways to overcome this. First of all, I think that if you've adjusted your window and level right and you give yourself a large enough image to view, you can see a change from what appears to be glandular tissue to more striated tissue, which is the muscle of the urogenital diaphragm. I'll admit I don't see that all the time either, but I think it's there a lot more than many people recognize. In areas of uncertainty, using a urethrogram to help define this, uh, where it cones into the uh, urogenital diaphragm, is another way to help um, identify the inferior most cuts of the prostate. The next step that I do is then go in and delineate the, the proximal and distal seminal vesicles. The uh, proximal seminal vesicles and the prostate are treated to the same dose under our treatment protocols. So. I am not too concerned if one slice may be called prostate and includes some seminal vesicle because these areas, especially the proximal seminal vesicle, will be taken to the same dose as the prostate target. Um, in, in, in trying to decide where seminal vesicles change from proximal to distal uh, is not really rocket science. I'll go in and count how many slices have seminal vesicle and divide by two. Uh, if there's clear abnormality in an area, I may include that in the higher dose region, but generally that's not an issue. Um, drawing the hip joints, again, um, I usually use interpretation tools here to construct those. Drawing every other uh, slice in the area where the contour is changing rapidly, and as we get more into the femoral shaft, uh, going every third slice just to keep the entire uh, planning session to around 15 to 20 minutes. Um, finally, the penile bulb. Uh, the penile bulb is always an issue. Uh, actually, we have a ongoing in-house protocol at Fox Chase trying to limit dose to the penile bulb. And what we have found that uh, we are most successful there if we use MRI uh, fusion with our images to do that. Um, if you're using CT alone, there can be wide variation on that. Um, outside of the protocol, we don't routinely MRI everybody for penile bulb, and surely if maintenance of erectile function is not an issue for a, a patient, uh, the delineation of the penile bulb is much less of an issue. I know my time is drawing just about to a close, so I'd like to talk about a couple of special cases that are always a challenge. Um, a little bit of fat is a good thing when you're drawing prostate volumes. Uh, if you get very thin patients, uh, the delineation of structures becomes quite a challenge. Uh, patients will often have very little fat between loops of bowel and bladder, uh, between the, the rectum and the prostate itself, and uh, these thin, older men um, can be a, quite a challenge. Um, a lot of bowel in the low pelvis is also uh, a question sometimes of where does bowel become, excuse me, where, where does um, colon become rectum, uh, and sometimes there are redundant loops of sigmoid down into that area. My guidance is if you're unsure, contour it and, and treat it gently. And finally, uh, and possibly a uh, subject for a future contouring challenge is the post-op patient, which is a, uh, a whole different kettle of fish in many ways. And that's pretty much how the gold standard uh, for this comparison study and this challenge was constructed. And I will stay on the line for questions and try to join as much of the remaining presentation as possible. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Sobchak. Um,
first of all, I just a few people were wondering if there were supposed to be slides along with that. Dr. Sobchak's presentation was verbal only, so uh, you didn't miss anything if you were thinking you should have seen some slides there. The other two presentations uh, will have slides, so um, if you don't see anything, then let us know. 